right. If you came with your Bible, you can turn to Acts chapter 14 as we prepare to study God's Word. Again, we are a simple church from Genesis to Revelation, 66 different books in the Bible. We are in year three of a journey, a four-year journey through the Bible. We find ourselves in the book of Acts. And really, in your Bible, it says the Acts of the Apostles. That's really the title of it. It should be the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. Jesus, you know, you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the accounts of the life of Christ, what he did on this planet, pretty wild. In three years of ministry, what was accomplished. And he was brutally murdered, sacrificed his life. He was buried. He rose from the grave. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he said, hey, hey, fellas, he comes back from the dead, which is crazy, just no big deal. And he tells his boys, he's like, hey, wait in Jerusalem, and then I'm gonna, you're going to receive power. And then when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. So isn't it, isn't it fascinating to think like this church is a continuation of, of the beginning of the book of Acts. So when we study the book of Acts, it's powerful. The, you and I are living in it. And it's not because you're sweet. I mean, it's because God's power and his spirit is flowing in and through you. And together, man, we get to see this church continue to move. And I don't know about you, but I just did a, I did a memorial service a celebration of life for one of my good friends. Uh, just a couple days ago, I worked with him for 10 years in broadcasting and came down with cancer, 54 years old. And I, you know, I stood up here with tears in my eyes celebrating his life. You know, we just don't know. We don't know when, when our last day is. We don't know our, some of our good friends when their last day is or family members. So listen, we need to have some urgency in these days, man. Like, don't, don't get just fat and happy as a Christian, man. Like, let's, let's go make a difference. And so when we, when we come together, like, end of the year offering, yeah, we're paying down debt. Not, but you know what we're really doing? We're, we're restoring some more resource so we can build other campuses, so we can double down online and reach more and more people. Man, you're going to snap your finger, and so am I. And we're gonna be translated, if you're a Christian, you're gonna be translated to heaven, where it's like streets of gold. It's gonna be just vibing on streets of gold. But in the interim, let's do something about it. There's hurting people, man. There's hurting people that we are called to reach. So I don't know why I just went off on that, but I, it's, I'm passionate about that, amen? Sometimes I can get a little complacent. Maybe I'm just preaching to myself. Todd, quit, quit being lazy and get out there and, and make a difference, amen? Uh, who's here for the very first time, by the way? Wait, just wave at me real quick. First timer, right on, man. Thanks for being with us. Anybody else? First timer right here. Oh, man, come on, dude. I like that hat, man. That's, that's dope. Are you a burger guy, by the way? You like, you like cheeseburgers? No. Hey, welcome anyways. Glad you're here. How about you, sir? You a burger guy? Okay. Pastor Casey, let me hook this, this young man up real quick. Hey, thanks for being with us, man. That's uh, Burger on God Day at Love Church. Thanks for being with us, man. Appreciate it. Where we uh, not only serve you burgers, but the Word of God. Flaming hot Word of God. So we're, you're like, get to it, will you? All right, church. Acts chapter 14. One of the challenges for us as Bible teachers, as we're reading with you throughout the week, is here's our prayer. Lord, what do you want to share to your church from that week's reading? And God will literally give us three, four messages. Pastor Mike O'Connell is in North Omaha at the North Omaha campus. And he said, man, I, I struggled because I had, you know, how many messages to share. Last week he shared from Acts chapter nine, um, you know, the Saul to Paul conversion. He said he had like four messages in that. I had the same challenge. I had probably three and I settled in onto this one because there was one word in this section and it was strengthen. And I'm like, well, if the Lord's asked us as a church and as individuals to be strong, to strengthen in 2025, 
I was like, okay, Holy Spirit, you wanna speak this. So I'm excited to teach it. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. ready. Maybe just if you have your Bible, just kind of lift it up in the air so I can see. I love physical Bibles, look at that. I got a, I got a, is that a maroon? Is that a purple Bible, Angie? That's pretty impressive right there. That is a thick purple Bible right there. It's got extra authority on it. So Chris, if you get out of line, just, just backside you with it real quick. No, she would never do that. Actually, well, we'll, we'll talk more about that later. All right. I love your guys' faith. It's cool. It, it energizes my faith when I see stories of God's glory, what he does all throughout this church, man. It's really remarkable. Even just looking in the family rooms, man, you know, one of the challenges at Miller North was when, you know, we wanted this environment where, where parents could have their kids learn the Bible at Love Kids, and they could come in here and be focused on the word, not like, dis- I don't wanna say distracted, but like, you know, like it, parents it didn't wear you out when you're trying to run around, you know, chase a two-year-old, you know? So it's a lose-lose proposition, right? Like the, the kid is like, who's the old guy trying to talk stuff that I don't understand? Then the parent is like trying to chase the kid, so they're not hearing the message. And I'm looking in the family, see the family in Miller North, they'd be isolated into this little classroom watching like a live feed. Isn't it cool that God provided a building with like glass right there where, look at, she's like feeding the baby right there, getting the word of God. How cool is that, man? Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? And on this side over here, just just rocking, look at Christian, like rocking with the new baby over there, man. Like, you can hear me, right? Right? Isn't that cool? It's because of God's faithfulness through you to give and give big. When this church was pretty small at Miller North, we were like, dude, we're just gonna go build a building during COVID. And all you crazy, faith-filled believers just got into it. And now, the word of God goes, generations. Be quiet, Ty, get into the Bible. Okay, okay, okay. Acts 14. Lord, you're, you're so good to us. You're so gracious. Thank you that your word is powerful. It's, it's magnetic. It, it draws us back. When we wander, it draws us back where there's peace, there's steadiness again, there's a solid foundation. And thank you for this great privilege that we have as a family to... Once again, go back to your word, go back to our roots, go back to what never changes. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we consider your word, we pray as always that Todd would be out of the equation, God the Holy Spirit would speak, you'd illuminate the scripture, and you'd just deepen our connection with you revitalize a fire that has waned. Strengthen our souls for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, the greatest desire of any good pastor is to see the people that God sends to the church not just come to Christ for their salvation moment, placing their faith in in Christ, which is great, that's a great day one, praise God. At the end of this message, we'll, we'll give an opportunity for people to literally get out of their seats and come forward and pray a prayer of salvation. It's beautiful. And that's day one, and we celebrate that, and I love that, and this is a very evangelistic church. However, the deep desire of any good pastor is to see that infant Christian begin to grow, begin to mature, begin to thrive. And it's the same thing as you parents. We're my parents out here, come on now. You want that little baby, what do you, you want that baby to grow up. You want Turner to grow and to succeed in life and to stand on your shoulders one day and thrive and and man, just just not miss out on anything God wants to do in his life. Come on parents, isn't that what you want? But some, if you're really, some of you parents, though, then sometimes you're like, dude, is this ever going to happen? Man, they, they can't get out of their own way at times. 
They come out of the womb talking about me, mine. Where's my bottle? Just poop my pants. Clean it up now. Shouldn't have said that in church. My bad. Sorry, Rachel. And you just see the, the heart of the parent. I mean, you could go business owner. You, you want your, your employees to succeed, to grow, to mature. Coaches, don't you want your players to thrive? Anybody? Any coaches in here? You could go on and on and on. When we read in Acts chapter 14, you see the same heart of Pastor Paul, the Apostle Paul. He, by God's grace, has this radical conversion. I mean, he is a... <laughs> He's a Jew who thinks this new sect of Christianity is, is like bunk. And so he's actually on a mission to go kill all these people. And then Jesus comes to him. He falls off his horse or his camel or whatever he was riding on. He's on his back. And, and, and Jesus comes and he's like, why are you persecuting me? And he has this conversion. And now he has this great privilege of bringing the, the gospel, the good news, that, that Jesus came to this planet to live the life you couldn't and die the death that you deserve, that I deserve, that rose from the grave, and now he's made a way for all of humanity to be made right with God. He has this great privilege, and he brings his homies. He's got, he's got Silas, he's got Barney. His name's Barnabas, but I call him Barney. And they have this great privilege, and they, and they just go on these missionary journeys. And you saw in the text their first missionary journey as they're wrapping it up, all these converts are coming to Christ, and what does he do? He's like, dude, we gotta stop at these different areas and strengthen the believers. What, he just didn't want converts. There, there's nothing, can you imagine if your kid is 18 still drinking the bottle? The tragedy is we have a whole huge group of Christians today that are still on the bottle at, at 18 years into the faith. And he's like, no, dude, no, don't, don't stay there. There's more. There's more. I want you to grow. I want you to be strengthened. Look at Galatians 4.19. Hopefully they'll have it. This is the area of the churches he's coming back in the area of Galatia. And he says this, my little children, there they are, my little children, for whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed in you. We just had our pastor, we, once a month, all of our pastors meet together. We break bread, just give life update, pray for one another, pray for you. That's our heart, that Christ would be formed in you. That Brie Bailey, there would be just be an, another level of sacrifice, another level of intimacy, another level. You know what my greatest prayer is for our church? Another, another level of humility. Oh man, can you imagine? That's a dreamland for me. Talk about humble. The CEO of the world coming and being born in a manger? Did I'd come in and be like, yo, give me the five-star hotel, bro. I'm the CEO of the world. Imagine Christ formed in you, humility. And then in 3 John 1, 4, this has been my verse. This has been like my seasonal verse right now. Check this out. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. When I hear reports of you guys, I'm looking at my son and daughter-in-law, when I see them lead and they're walking in truth and thriving. Parents, the little dude that was an infant that couldn't get out of his own way, now all of a sudden, like he owns his own home. He's loving his wife like Christ loved the church. He's giving away, he's hosting a small group. Like they're doing this together. There's no greater joy. It's like a love, it's like, it's like a joy bomb goes in you. As a parent, I have no greater joy. We were just with Blaze and Maya last night hanging out, man, and just seeing them together. Just got married, bought their first house, getting after it, working hard, getting up early. I asked him his workout rhythms. He's not working out all that much, so I got to get on him on that. But <laughs> that aside, they're doing well. I look at Cap, P Pastor Cap and Pastor Michael O'Connell. They were kind of like my twins, you know, like my, my spiritual twins. And to see what God's doing in their life. Michael O'Connell bringing the word in North Omaha right now with fire and conviction and humility. There's nothing greater that happens in my soul to see my kids, <laughs> sorry, Cap, my, my, walking in truth. Brings me great joy. There's, parents, right? Is there anything greater? 
just looking at you, you know, just seeing your little baby boy with just like little spiky hair. Don't you, what's your heart's desire, your cry? I mean, get tight with the Lord. Can you imagine him walking in truth? Like, like the love of God and the joy of God just abounding through him. I see that. So that's what Paul's heart is. So verse 21 of Acts 14, <laughs> you're like, get in the word, my bad. After preaching the good news in Derby and making many disciples, remember this, there was revival happening, man. People were believing in Christ, that he was the, the Messiah that was predicted for centuries. And people were believing as Paul, and picture this, now Paul knew the Old Testament scriptures. He knew the prophecies. And now God sends him to the Gentile. Like he's, he's sharing, well, with Jews and Gentiles, he's sharing this truth. Many people are coming to Christ. So Paul and Barnabas, they return to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch of Pisidia, these were all different areas that these mini revivals, it'd be like Billy Graham showing up into a town for a certain time. And, and all these people are coming to Christ at these altar calls. And now, now they wanted to go back in verse 22 where they strengthened the believers. Someone say strengthen. Strengthen the believers. That was their heart. I think about over the last 17 years, by God's grace, how many disciples were ma- have been made through this work that God has begun. And this is just the beginning. We're talking about generations to come through this ministry, what he wants to do in strengthening bl- the believers. I was listening to a message one time by a pastor, and he said a phrase, and it, and it, it rocked me. And he said this. He said, evangelism without discipleship is cruelty. You guys have that quote? Did you have that? I I wrote it down there in my notes so you guys could see literally on the screen. Evangelism without discipleship is cruelty. And I'm like, dude, I I don't want to be that guy. I don't want just a bunch of people to come to Christ and then they don't grow in their faith. So how do we disciple? How do we help? How do we help strengthen? How do we... How do we see this happen? Well, Paul and Barney will give you a couple things in the text today that I just want to communicate. And as we look to 2025, as we as a team, we as a family continue to grow, as we see infants turn into little kids who grow into adolescents, who, who grow into mature adults, we're going to do this together. And number one, if you're a note taker, jot it down. It's going to take perseverance. Perseverance. We live in a culture where it's like, snap your finger, I'm like a TikTok sensation. That's not how we make disciples. Now, God can do whatever he wants, and he's, I've seen him do it. I saw him do it in Cap's life, and so he can do what he wants. I, I'm not, I'm not going to put God in the box. However, I've seen the most mature believers persevere through, through some pretty tough scenarios and seasons of life. Look what they do. So they, they come back through these area and look at verse 22, the second half of 22. They, they encourage them to continue in the faith. Underline that in your Bible. If you're tempted to like go back to your old life right now, underline this. They encourage them to continue in the faith, reminding them that we must suffer many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Don't you love that? Yes. What did Jesus say? In this world, you will have trial, but fear not because I've overcome it. That's one, that's one of the, the, the Bible verses that none of us like to underline. <laughs> he's, he's like, hey, I just want to remind you, you're just going to suffer. <laughs> awesome. But I, you know, I've, I've reviewed my life. I, you know, I'm sniffing 50, I'll be 50 in March, and I don't know what it is. Where my 50, my 50 crowd, man? Like, don't you like just pause and go like, you like always looking through old photos, you know, and you're like, I've been, no, you're not doing that. Okay, well, I, I, I'm, I'm doing it. And I think about some of, some of the most powerful seasons of my life were some of the most painful seasons of my life. When I really grew in my faith, and, and my faith was deepened, and, and I persevered through a season. 
It's the whole thing, you know, no pain, no gain, right? No pain, no gain. As I was studying this, I was like, okay, who, who's, who's saying this? Because it's one thing like to preach something and to say something. It's a whole other thing to live it. You know what I'm saying? When someone like your boss is like telling you to do something, but they do it themselves, they're like, make sure you're early to work. And then they come in 15 minutes late. You're like, bro, that, that brings no weight at all. Right? Am I right? But when, when the person leading you is not just saying it, but doing it, now there's like, there's some solidarity with what they're saying and you can follow them. Well, again, Paul and Barnabas are the one that are telling these believers, hey, you're going to suffer a lot. Don't abandon your faith. Stay encouraged. Did you, I don't know if you read in verse, in chapter 14, right before this section of text, do you remember what Paul, what happened to Paul? Paul was preaching the gospel and they took stones. They were, they're so jealous, these Jews. They, they chased them down to town. Can you imagine this? They like literally get in like a, like on their horses. They're like, we gotta like put something, we gotta put this thing out. And they stone him so bad that Paul, <laughs> Paul is down. Did that scare you? I'm sorry, my bad. I'm trying, but I'm trying to bring you in. Like, you, not stoned recreationally. He is stoned with stones. The guy is like big rocks are in his grill. And the, actually, the, the Bible actually says, I don't know if you read this, but the Bible says that they stoned them and they thought he was dead. So they, to the point where they left, they're like, oh, mission accomplished. We put a stop to that whole deal. And the, the homie gets up and he doesn't like run and get out of town. He goes back into town to finish the job. Yeah. Yeah. I'm reading that. I'm like, not me. I got like this gnarly stomach virus recently. I'm like, God, do you really love me anymore? I'm like, look, I'm going to tap out. It's getting tough, dude. I'm out. Going to Costco. <laughs> Paul, like, no, he. By the way, total side note if you look in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about, we, many scholars believe this actually event. And he says, he goes, hey, uh, at one time 14 years ago, I got caught up to the third heaven. And I, I don't know if I was dead or if I was just in a vision, but I saw such amazing things. I, I can't even describe how awesome it is. And I had this abundant of revelation about heaven. And because of that, a, a messenger of Satan was sent to buffet me to keep me humble so I wouldn't get prideful. And a lot of scholars submit that Paul, the thorn in the flesh, was a physical ailment that he got from the stoning at that point that carried him through life. He, you know what he did? He limped through life. But you know what that limp did? It actually gave him a deeper sense of trust and dependence on God. He, he, he persevered. Christian, here's the question. Are you and I continuing to grow while in a season of suffering? Are we growing? Are we just mad at God? Questioning, why would you allow this to happen? God, if you really love me, if you're really good, how can you allow that to happen? Which again, no shame, no blame. We've all been there. James, one of our favorite verses as Christians, James 1, I'm just gonna read it for us. Dear brothers and sisters at Love Church, when, underline, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy why? For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance, your perseverance, has a chance to grow. Everybody say grow. grow. It's one of the greatest ways to grow. Just get in the middle of chaos. Verse four, so let it grow. Let it grow. For when your endurance, your perseverance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Needing nothing. A couple chapters earlier in chapter 12, this really wrecked me. It said that James, the brother of John, was killed with a sword. And then Peter was imprisoned. 
And the church began to pray. And the church prays. Did you read this? <laughs> and they prayed so hard that an angel came and bailed Peter out of jail. And Peter's like, he doesn't know. He's like, what's going on? And he runs and he like, he runs out of town like the gates open as he like he's exiting town and he goes to the prayer meeting. He's knocking on the door and uh, what's the lady's name? Rhoda comes and answers the door. He's like, dudes, I'm here. Your prayers worked. And Rhoda's like, ah, oh, sick. And she like she was so excited she didn't open the door. So she like ran and all the people are praying. They're like, oh, Lord, you know, just bless Peter, like be with him or whatever. And they're, Peter's here. And they're, they're like, you're out of your mind. Like, what? first of all, it wasn't the faith of their prayers that, that got Peter out of jail. It was just the sovereign work of God. And so here, 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 here's why I bring that up. I'm reading this and I'm going, why, God? I'm having a tough time with this. James was killed with the sword, but Peter was freed. Do you ever ask yourself, hey, I've been just praying for that person to be healed or that I would be healed, and for whatever reason... God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. But then the other person is miraculously healed. And sometimes in your mind, you go, I can't compute that at all. Yeah. Welcome to the mystery. Yeah. Welcome to the mystery. I was studying this, and God gave me a word. You ready for it? Write it down in your notes. The mystery. Can you and I as believers persevere and grow right in the middle of the mess? The mystery of God. I don't know about you, but I, I struggle with that. I really believe, though, the maturity happens in the mystery. When we can just let go and be like, God, I don't understand it, but you're still good, and I love you, and I'm going to submit to your sovereignty. I'm going to settle at the extreme. I'm just going to worship and praise you, no matter if I'm healed or not, no matter if my loved one comes down with cancer or not, no matter if I have this limp for the rest of my life or not, I'm still going to worship you. And I'm telling you, when that church can land in that place and live in that place, you're going to see something different. And you saw it right here. Peter, by the way, it just wasn't his time. You know how Peter died? Anybody know? Peter was crucified upside down. How gangster is that? They went to go crucify him. He's like, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. Flip me upside down. Talk about perseverance and maturity. Some of my most profound teachers in the faith have been the ones who have gone through the most miserable and dire, chaotic life circumstances and yet have grown closer to God through the process. Because here's what I always see it. When, when, when a human goes through super painful, chaotic, I see one of two things. I see, I'm out of here. If that's who God is, I'm out of here. Or I see, this sucks real bad. I hate this. And they're still having a conversation with God. But you know what? They're like, but though you slay me, I still will praise you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they continue to move forward. One, one of my friends in ministry, several years ago now, Right around this season, we're getting closer to Christmas. His young daughter, I think she might have been seven at the time, had an asthma attack and died in his arms. Here's a man that God called to a ministry that is affecting many, many thousands of people. And right in the middle of it, can you imagine? Can you imagine the question he's asking? God, I'm faithfully worshiping you. I'm faithfully serving you, and my daughter is gone? Put yourself in his shoes, her shoes, him and his wife. Instead of tapping, they doubled down. They wrote a book about it, and they actually went across the country helping people that are walking through the same thing turn their eyes back to Jesus. That, to me, <laughs> talk about maturing, strengthening, Doubly down. I, one of my friends right now came down with brain cancer. He said that this is, the, this is the season of his life he's drawn closer to God than ever before. He, he prays for me every day. Like, bro, you didn't ever even used to pray, really, did you, dude? I mess with him. Every day. 
He's persevering. Persevering, number one, probably spent too much, but maybe that's the word, maybe that's the one word that we need to get as a church, this maturing, this strengthening in this next year. Number two, quickly, verse 23, you can jot down pastoring, pastoring, leading. Paul and Barnabas also, what did they do? They knew that they couldn't just pastor every single area So what did they do? They appointed elders in every church with prayer and fasting. They turned the elders over to the care of the Lord in whom they had put their trust. So this is fascinating to me. They they literally, these, these early converts, these early churches, these pockets in these different towns of Christ followers would start. So they'd go and they would encourage them. Hey man, stay strong even through persecution and pain. And then they, they delegated, they would pray and fast and they would ask the Lord, who, is, who are some of the leaders that they can give the, the, the ownership or the leadership responsibility to? And they would delegate that. And then they would trust those people to the Lord's care. And that's powerful. Someone say delegation. That's really what it is. They're, they're delegating authority and they're trusting God to be able to do it. And let me just say this briefly on this, on this topic. And you can just look around real quick. Just look around the church real quick. This is just the 9 a.m. at Elkhorn South, not to mention online, North Omaha, the 11, and what God wants to do. Right now, as a pastoral team, it is impossible to care properly and see you strengthen and mature in your faith and help you grow by ourselves. So what does that mean? We better grow up a lot more leaders who are willing to get in the game. I'm looking at you guys right now. For whatever reason, there's leadership on you guys. I don't know where you're at, but I'm saying, like, if this is your church, get in the game and start leading, man. You got leadership capacity. Stand up real quick if you can, Pastor Casey, real quick here. It was really cool. So Pastor Casey, in this season, he's our our group's pastor, and he just sent out something recently. He's like, yo, you want to get in the game and start leading the group? You don't have to be Billy Graham. Here's what you have to have a heart for Jesus, and a heart to care for people. That's what you need. Just in the last two weeks, I've met with probably three or four, probably five people. One dude just came up to me in the gym. He's like, dude, I kind of fell off my faith. I need some help. I got to pray for, he's like, he's literally, comes, can you pray for me? And I, that was great. But then in my next night, I'm like, what group are you in? Who, who, can you, who can you stay accountable with? Who can you lock arms with? So he sends something out, and I would just tell you guys, pray and obey. It's not just giving financially, give time, give energy, give leadership responsibility. You have, here's your requirement. Do you have a heart to care? Really? Get in the game. Amen? All right. Give it up for Pastor Casey, by the way. And also, listen, all the current group leaders, can you just stand real quick? If you're a current group leader, just stand. I want to honor you guys as you care for the flock. Let's give it up for all the current leaders, all the group leaders. Thank you guys all across the building. Thank you, and online. Man, get in the game. That's how we are gonna continue to grow. We don't have time to talk about it, but jot down, if you're considering this as a role, uh, 1 Timothy chapter three, one through seven. I I can't teach it right now. Jot it down if you're prayerfully considering leading. Here's some great biblical requirements or considerations when leading in the church, and it's just beautiful. Beautiful beautiful. It actually says that you desire an honorable position. And then it goes on through some different things. We're on a journey together. I I, I wanted to honor my wife too. Just recently, she led a team of leaders through the book called Soul Care. Uh, Anybody involved in that? I mean, it's beautiful if if you've never read the book. And it's helpful because it helps facilitate us allowing God to minister to deep hurts and pains and losses and abuses that happen in our life and allow God to take some of that junk out so we can be more and more free. And I I mean, crazy ladies at like, I don't know, 6 a.m. on a Friday, five. Y'all are nuts. What I loved about that, though, is this is the church saying, if you want to grow and you're tired of bitterness and resentment and locking yourself in this this place of rage and you want to be free from that, Take, take early morning Friday and get, and get through it. And you guys did it, and so I honor you for pastoring the people. I love it. Number three, preaching, jotted down, verse 24. 
Verse 24, they traveled back through Pisidia and Pamphylia. They preached, there it is, they preached the word in Perga. They went down to Italia. They preached. And it's not just preaching the word like one of us or like, again, Matt Rose and Mike Letson on Self Fed 365. It's not just that, but I would just say this. It's you and I as Christians preaching the word on the street. You're like, oh, I don't, I'm not a preacher. You can be. You don't have to be a weirdo. You can take what you're reading and then bring it to people at work, at school, on your teams, in a very natural and encouraging way. Paul wrote to Timothy in chapter four, verse two. He said, preach the word, be prepared, whether time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people. I love that. With good teaching. So, you know, it doesn't matter where you're at. This, this young couple that I married recently, I challenged them to get in the word, our daily reading, but also the proverb of the day. And there's, there's, the dude is a young, sharp, smart dude. His wife, you know, same, same type. They're just amazing young couple. I'm like, take in what God's given you and then just give it out. Jesus is the bread of life. The word of God is the bread of life. Eat the loaves of bread every day and then give it out. I like what Pastor Mike talks about. If you just got crumbs to give out, that's all you're, you're, you're bringing in. That's all you can give out. Take loaves of bread of the word of God so you can bring it out. And not in a weird, you know, Bible-beating way, but an encouraging way. One, one thing happened to me recently. I was, um, had the privilege of broadcasting like a, a KU Houston game. This is weeks ago. And before the game, I was walking, just praying for players and coaches and connecting with people. And there was a uh, equipment, equipment guy, and they were playing catch. And I, I'm a weirdo. I like football. So I like play catch every time before a game. And I was playing catch with these guys. And I got to know this young guy. He's a junior at Houston. And he was talking about, hey, I want to get into broadcasting. Can you tell me a little bit about it? So we're going back and forth as I'm like, you know, throwing the ball. He's giving it to me. And then uh, we, started, we started talking about earlier that day, I was reading something about discipline from the Proverbs. So I said, yeah, and this is one of the things that's helped me in broadcasting. And I gave him a proverb of the day and challenged him. And then at the end of it, I'm like, hey, would you mind if I pray for you? I didn't headlock him and be like, I'm praying for you, you dude, you need to get right. Would you mind if I pray for you? And pray just blessing over his, his, his future. It's, you see what I'm saying? Like, you can preach. I'm, I'm trying to help you. <laughs> you can preach. You don't get this mindset of preach like, you know, hellfire and bring the house. No, no, no. You can bring the word of God in a very practical and powerful way. Last thing, golly, progress. And I put report in parentheses, the progress report. I love this part. Let's finish it up, 26, verse 26. Finally, they returned by the ship to Antioch of Syria where their journey had begun. So remember, they started in Antioch. They, they prayed, they fasted, they were sent out. They went to these different places Revival's breaking out. They went back. They strengthened them a little bit more. Now they're back to their main hub in Antioch. And the believers there had entrusted them to the grace of God to do the work they had now completed. 27, upon arriving in Antioch, they called the church together and reported everything, I, and I underline this in my Bible, God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles too and they stayed there with the believers for a long time. I love that. So one way that they strengthen this particular church, remember, God's church is one big church in multiple locations, and in Antioch, one of the, the main ways that they strengthened was through story. They came back and they brought a report, not to puff themselves up like, you know, notches on their belt for all the souls saved, but no, they were giving praise to God. And how many of you, are you encouraged when we share stories? Were you encouraged when you saw Matt's story in here? Matt's going through a lot. He's going through a lot in life right now. And did you hear what he said? I'm trusting more and more. I, I'm a control guy. We're my control people, right? And all of a sudden you're like, oh, I can't control that. God's like, exactly. Can you trust me? And he's growing in that. So what happens? Your, strength, your faith is strengthened because of his story. And I told our team, man, let's continue, baptism stories, continue to bring reports of what God is doing 
in our life and our, strength, our faith will be strengthened. In Revelation 12, 11, it says, we defeated the enemy by the blood of the lamb and their testimony. That's what we wanna do, amen? God, thank you so much for this word, so good. And I just see you building a strong church as you strengthen individuals and families. Both here at Elkhorn South, North Omaha online, all of our friends joining, we pray, God, like never before, not just converts, not just infant Christians, but we pray for a maturity day by day as we say, strengthened in your scriptures through all circumstances will depend on your spirit. We'll worship you no matter what's going on. I want to see our friends, our family saved, set apart, no longer bound in alcohol, no longer bound in bitterness, but free to live the life that you've always called us to. So we as a church, we, we pray you would strengthen us in these days. In Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I want to 